introduce my son. And I tell you what, the way he carried this thing while we were in Europe uh, was absolutely incredible for that first week. And we were glad to come lift it off him when we could get home. But uh, it's good. Phil, come. So good. This is exciting. Thank you for that welcome. That was awesome. <clears throat> well, I get to talk about uh, something that's very exciting to me, and that's uh, pastoring. And we've been taking this month and just talking about fivefold ministry because we need to be aware of the giftings that are flowing among us. And so, fivefold ministry doesn't mean we're introducing who, who the leadership is. It's us beginning to understand who we are. And I thought Nate really brought it uh, with his word about this is something for all of us. Like, the fivefold is for all of us. And each and every one of us play a part in it in different ways. And that's what's so exciting about what God's doing in this hour. And so we're just going to take a little bit of time and then uh, just talking about uh, who, who the pastor is and, and what that gifting looks like. And passwords are getting longer and longer, so you have to give me like a minute here. It wasn't quite a minute, but I just wrote some things out that um, I kind of think, and just, just some things that I'd, I had come up with, but um, to talk about that pastoral gift and what that looks like. But so I wrote some stuff out here, and if any of these identify with you, there's probably some pastor in you. But if you walk in a room and your eye goes to the person that is alone, yes. how many times have you done that? If you've been able to tell when a person is hurting, whether they out outwardly show it or not. If you find yourself patiently listening to somebody's story, no matter how long it takes. <laughs> if you find yourself catching things that could potentially be offensive and suggesting a more diplomatic word or approach. If you find yourself like an open book, quick to share a story of your own life for someone to be able to help that person through their healing process. If you find yourself comfortable relating to people despite their race, upbringing, socioeconomic status, and, it, and it's a relating in a way that feels natural. It, it's like you understand what Paul was saying about being all things to all people. Even your vocabulary and, and the way your body language, your body language changes when you're, when you're around certain people. That's a good indicator. And if you find that you're a very sensitive person, we'll stop with that one. <laughs> so uh, some of what I'm going to be bringing is from uh, kind of my spiritual grandfather, my my father's spiritual father, Philip Morbier, and we've talked about him a little bit, but he, he modeled and walked out and lived out what fivefold team ministry looks like. So some of what I'm going to be bringing to you is from his book, The Hands of Jesus, and then some of it is just from some of my life experience. But he, he, used, to, um, he used to just be such a role model for me, and I, I just remember I, I would get around him and I would just start to weep and I wouldn't know why. It's just he carried such a sensitivity and a passion for Jesus that it was just infectious. And I just wanted to be around him. And I remember one time I told a joke, and it wasn't that funny, but I thought the joke insulted him. And man, I just sat there bawling as a nine-year-old, and he just came up and comforted me. And he just so represented the love of the shepherd. He just represented Jesus so well. And for me personally and my wife, um, I just have the honor of coming from a long line of pastors, and pastoring wasn't something that I wanted to do. Um, I, I've seen so much and had so many friends that were pastors' kids. I've, I've been around that culture, obviously, my whole life to see how hard it can be on the family and how hard it can be on even the, the relationships of that pastor and their relationship with God can be such a draining thing. It can be such a demanding thing. And it's not it, just something that I, I didn't want to do. And, and I'd come from a line of 
very dedicated pastors. My, my great-grandfather helped start Denver Bible College, which is now Colorado Christian University. And uh, at the time, in the early 1900s, you put your children into a children's home. You, that's what you did. Because you had a mission, and your primary mission was ministry. But yet God is beginning to open up and unravel a mystery that is family to our church and a whole new appreciation of what ministry looks like, ministering to one another, ministering to God. It's just changing everything, but in that process, I saw the damage and the hurt through the generations. I, I saw my grandfather, who incredible missionary, did so many incredible things in Africa, um, pioneered works, built stuff, built facilities. I've watched my father even just give everything in his life and I could stand saying he was an incredible father. But in all of that, we've, we've, it's like we've inherited a, a broken system. We've inherited something that has forgotten family in so many ways. And now through the restoration and healing of what my father went through, when he was faced to raise his family by himself, when he was faced to have uh, a father that the only thing he knew was to be abusive because that's what he grew up with. And to see all of that, I thought, man, there's so many other things that I can do. But do I really want to do that? And so I just told the Lord when he came and, and asked me if I wanted to be a pastor, I just said, no, I really don't want to. And, uh, and then he came back and he said, well, would you be willing for me to help you to be willing? to be a pastor. And how many know that is Jehovah sneaky at his best? <laughs> because it's so easy to say, sure, you know, whatever, whatever, sure, you know. And then what he began to show me was that uh, I, I, one day I'll share my testimony again, and, and Nathan uh, was out there with me in the airlines, but I had the incredible privilege of sharing the gospel with each and every person in the airline, past, present, uh, employees, station managers, out of its incredible opportunity to, to do very, two very significant funerals, including our general manager, uh, who I was able to lead to the Lord uh, when he passed away. And then the airlines flew in people from all of the country so that every employee had a time to grieve. Every employee had a chance to attend the funeral. And at that funeral, we got to share. And Mary, I think you were there too. So what a beautiful opportunity. But in that, um, I had a nickname, and the nickname was Dr. Phil. <laughs> because for whatever reason, people would just come to me, and they would share their problems. And then out of my mouth, I would watch these like words of wisdom march out, and I'd be like, where did those come from? <laughs> they come from my brain. But I would watch them just flow out, and then people get touched, and then people began to come and asking for prayer, asking for advice. Um, and I, I, I just got to be a pastor to the people uh, in that airline. And that's what the Lord showed me, that right after I said, yeah, sure, I'm willing for you to help me to be willing, he said, you've already been it. It's who you are. It's naturally who you are, so you're just being who you are. Isn't that interesting, that, that the Lord can go back and show you places in your life and you realize hey, I can do this because it's who I am. You know, um, it, it's interesting, though, because I think we've, we've kind of come into a place where we, we look at it, um, a pastor in, in, in kind of a, two different lights. And I think the classic thing is what the, the, the chief cook and bottle washer, that's generally the expression, right? Kind of do everything, drive the van, do the dishes, take the calls, you, you do everything, and you're expected to be everything because you're paid to do that, right? You're paid to be everything to everyone. Well, there, I don't believe that's the right understanding, but then over here on the other side is this understanding of, of a pastor as a dignitary, that I, 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 I should have a title, I need to have a title, I need to be respected, um, in fact, even the understanding that a pastor is naturally a leader. 
Because we're going to look just in just a minute and see that that's actually two different things. So there's this been understanding uh, that has come through the church, and a lot of that is, came through Constantine and, and, a, and an act to preserve the church in the face of persecution, that it became this position instead of a function. And uh, I like what Philip says. He says, so we have dignitaries instead of functionaries. But God's called that gift, just as we've heard these other gifts through this month, these are for the body, and this is a function of who God created you to be that's coming out full of the Holy Spirit. The term pastor is actually only used one time, uh, and then shepherd is used 18 times in the New Testament. And there's this understanding through these two Greek words. Uh, it's bosco and poimaino. I think I said that right. To feed and to nourish is what bosco means. Poimaino means to tend and to care. So, so there's the function of the shepherd. And in fact, the, uh, the term, a leader in the New Testament, is, is a prost, proste me. That's as good as it's getting from me. <laughs> proste me. Um, but one who is called to lead. And it actually distinguishes that. It, it, it shows that. It, it, if you're called to lead, if you're called... So uh, we, we've kind of put both of those terms together. And I want to be careful with what I'm saying because a shepherd is called to direct. There is some directive. There is some guidance. There is some, but it doesn't necessarily mean the shepherd has to be the leader of the church because the shepherd is a gifting encompassed in the fivefold. And this fivefold is so powerful together. And so this fivefold, I believe, was never an, it's supposed to be a hierarchy system. I believe that it was supposed to be Brothers and sisters functioning together so that the apostle and the prophet and the teacher had no less standing than the shepherd. In fact, when you start to look into it in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, and, and I don't believe this was a hierarchical system he was laying out. He was talking about authority. He was talking about some different functions, but actually in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about uh, first the apostle, then the prophet, uh, then the teacher, and it goes through all those, but it leaves out one gifting. Shepherd, pastor. Isn't that interesting? Why? Because the, the, the shepherd is an organic, integral piece that is so necessary that I believe he didn't even have to put it in there. This is something we all need. We all need shepherds in our lives. So where the scripture actually talks about leadership and the function of leadership is not necessarily just with one man, but actually if you look in Acts 14, it's the elders. It's the team of elders that actually gives direction to the church. And that's how it is here at Dayspring. We have a group of elders. And if you're an elder this morning, would you just stand up? These elders have been charged to care for this body, to love this body. I know we have a number of ways this morning, but thank you. But these elders have been charged to, can we, can we just lift those guys up? They're amazing. But we, we find direction as a team. We find a direction as the five-fold functions and works together, which is why we have uh, teaching teams at Dayspring. Teaching teams are encompassed of, uh, they're encom encompassing all of these five-fold giftings so that we can be equipped. And I'm not going to get into that anymore. Nate covered that really, really well the last time he spoke. But so we, we've got to begin to see that, uh, that oftentimes we've elevated one person or one position above the other positions. And the hard and I think the sad reality is that many institutions, biblical institutions, teach the pastor to be that, to be the all, to be everything stops there, to, to be the one that uh, has to do everything. And then there is an expectation with the congregation for that to be the case too. And that's something that God wants to unravel because that's not what the early church community looked like. It was everyone functioning to, together, everyone walking hand in hand. They were growing together. They were building together. And so this pastoral function is something so necessary. But I just want to say again, it doesn't necessarily mean a call of leadership. Now for me personally, I feel the call to lead too. And I'm also the pastor. So those things come together, but it doesn't have to be the case. Pastor does not mean you have to get in front of people and preach. Pastor doesn't mean that, that you have to be responsible 
to, to, to uh, completely let your life go and watch your family fall apart around you for the sake of other people. So there are some big misunderstandings with the functioning of what a pastor means. But what God wants is to restore that alongside the other giftings so that we can honor each other. Yes. We're all different. We're all called to these different places. So I just want to do uh, take just a couple seconds, and we're going to go over uh, to Ezekiel. And uh, if you just turn with me, I'm going to be reading out of New American Standard. Um, we're just going to run over here. And uh, I want to just take some time in Ezekiel chapter 34. So I'm going to give you a minute to turn there. But this is Jesus, this is the Father as the great shepherd coming to say, hey, I'm going to be your shepherd now. And what I want to look in this chapter is at some of the things that God was pointing out that needed to have happened that didn't happen. Because I think a lot of our functioning as pastors can come out of an understanding of this chapter. But in Ezekiel chapter 34, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Woe, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The diseased, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. And they were scattered for a lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. Wow. Well, that kind of tells you some of the functions that, that we're called to do. That tending and caring. There's an element of protection. There's an element of, uh, of running after. Of fighting for. You know, the Lord, he fights for our wholeness and healing. And, and, and as pastors, we're called to fight for those around us. But we can't fight unless we've adopted each other in a way that... You are not just my business, but you are my brother and my sister. Amen. And we have to do that through the spirit of adoption. That's why I want to give a plug for Nick Billman. We have such a special Easter service. Good Friday, we're going to have worship. Saturday morning, uh, we're going to start the first of a series called Family Matters, where we're going to be dealing with some tough topics. But in these Family Matter workshops, Saturday morning, we're going to talk about the spirit of adoption. Because how do you fight for each other You'll only fight for each other if you adopt each other. You always fight for family. And we need to adopt each other and understand what the spirit of adoption means for us to go a deeper level in what this community thing looks like. And so I just want to encourage you this morning that in that, there is this, 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 uh, this ownership that, that, that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna lead by example. We're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to, surround ourselves with the people that we've been called to minister to with the giftings that God has given us as pastors. We have to be in and among. We have to be a part of, because that is the call of the shepherd, is to be right in the middle of the flock. And I think what this speaks to reminds me of a story that, that Phil shared one time. He said this tourist was in a, a country, <clears throat> and he was just very observant. It was a, it was a real nomadic uh, uh, country, and and uh, this tourist was with his guide and, and kind of looked around. And, and he saw this, uh, this man with a stick chasing after these sheep and, and these uh, sheep dogs with him, like just barking. And he was chasing the sheep. And he thought, man, I, I, I wonder if that's how they shepherd in this country. And then he went somewhere else. Well, he went into another rural region, and he ended up seeing, like, what we would think of as shepherd. Here's a guy just calm, hanging out with the staff, you know, in the middle, uh, involved. But he was also guiding and leading, and he constantly was in communication with his flock. He was looking back to make sure all the heads were accounted for. And so, just puzzled, he, uh, he asked the guy, because this guide was with him the whole time. He, he asked the guide, and he said, so do you have two different types of shepherding in your, in your nation? He said, two types of shepherding? He said, yeah. The, the first guy we saw with, that was running after the sheep with the stick, he said, oh, that was the butcher. <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we, can, we can have some different interpretations for how we're supposed to lead. But I believe that we always lead with an open hand and not a clenched fist. You know, we always lead so that... Uh, God can work through us 
And then we can have that anointing oil. We can have that refreshing water. We can have those things that, that, that the people around us need because our heart burns for them. If you're a shepherd, your heart burns for the people around you. And so let's just take a look at what Jesus, or, or what the Father's going to do. And let's go over uh, Ezekiel, same chapter 34, but let's run, uh, jump up to 11, verse 11 here. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep. So I will care for my sheep, and I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and a gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on the mountain highs of Israel. Then they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pastures. <laughs> I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. So what you see there is, is so much of that is, the, is, is that the protector nature, but the, the shepherd nature that Jesus actually was commissioned to do when he fulfilled. This is the year of the Lord's favor. You know, this is that time where Jesus is coming as that, um, as the fulfillment of that promise that here he is coming to, to, to bind up broken hearts, to do the very thing that the shepherd will do. And of course, Jesus is that great shepherd for us, a shepherd that was willing to lay down his life. And there's just nothing greater than our, our willingness to be able to lay down our life for each other. And when we look at these uh, aspects of a, of a shepherd, I'm just going to touch on a, a couple things that Phil had, but what we see coming out is, is a nature of a very temperate person, of a prudent person, uh, and, and a person that really has to walk um, thinking uh, uh, for, the, for the greater good. It's beyond our understanding to walk free from addiction. I think that's just so important. As, as we shepherd, that we can shepherd out of the freedom that we've attained ourselves. And I'm talking about addiction much wider than just drugs and alcohol. You know, I know for me, I, I used to be an avid gamer. And then just one day, the Lord just gently came to me and he just said, Phil, would you be willing to give up games? Just completely, and I have. And because I would go to work with bloodshot eyes, like playing all the online stuff. And you know... Um, and thank God that happened before I was married. <laughs> but, but, you know, he came in just such a gentle way because he realized that was an area of my life that could affect other people, that, that, that would cause the Father not to be able to work through me in that specific area of my life. And if, I, if something was controlling me, then he wasn't. And I think it's that simple as an addiction. If something else is controlling you, that's not good. If you don't have power over that thing, and I think we've been redefining addiction as, okay, it, it's not, it doesn't even have to be a habitual thing. It's something that you don't have power over when it comes. Yeah. That's, that's what addiction is. So there's this uh, understanding of being hospitable, of an ability to be able to keep confidence. And, and I think there's a new safe in our community. We're understanding safe in different ways. I think safe has been defined as, I'll keep on the lid on it, brother. You know, but now safe is, it's safe so you can be transparent. It's safe so you can share with me broken areas of your life because guess what? I'm broken too. See, that's safety. That's heaven's safety system is when we're able to share with each other. But it doesn't mean sometimes as a pastor you don't have to keep confidence. And sometimes it's so important to be a, a man of integrity, a man of your word, a woman of your word, a woman of integrity, so that we... Uh, can, can walk with the trust and the hearts of the people that God has called us to shepherd. This understanding of, of, of being patient, of being a person of the supernatural, because it doesn't matter how many words we have. In fact, I love one of Phil's quotes. He said, one action of love, one single mission of mercy, or one act of identification with someone will substantiate 100 sermons and make far more impact than a 1,000 words that you could share over someone. You know, God, God, is, God is looking for compassionate hearts to care for the needs of his people. 
Pastoring is not defined by a leadership role. Pastor is not defined how often you speak on the pulpit or, 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 or that you have to be on salary or that you know it's a function of Jesus' hands giving life-giving hope to the people of God. And that's what a pastor is. So that means that all of us cannot only walk as pastors, as shepherds, whether you're here or not, whether you're, it doesn't matter, it's who you are, but we also can also walk in the anointing of a shepherd. And I think sometimes we don't always think about, oh, I just function as a pastor. You know, we can think about, I just function in the prophetic. Wow, I just spoke that word. You know, I'm not a prophet, but I just function in the prophetic, and, and I just shared a word, and it changed that person's life. Well, going back to the beginning, when you, you don't normally find yourself, and Nate talked about that last week, when you don't normally find yourself as a super patient person, but somehow you have the grace to listen to a whole story, you just operated in the, 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 the pastoral anointing, right? If you walk in a room and you see somebody that you don't what, normally see, but they're hurting, then you function in that pastoral anointing. We can all flow in it because it's part of who Jesus is and Jesus is in us. So again, I just want to put that down today that a, that a pastor is not defined by a, a role or a title or a paycheck, but it's who you are and it's what the body needs in such a special way. We need pastors. But to be a person of the supernatural, I tell you what, the best thing you can have, because we can have an, an automatic sympathy as pastors, just very sympathetic, but we need empathy. We need more than that. We need love in action. We need compassion in action. But that happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. So pastors have to be people of the supernatural. We've got to be people of the supernatural that are dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit to bring change. I've shared this story a thousand times, and I'll share it again because it's the, the heart of the Father, no matter what your giftings are. But I was in a counseling session. I was going to ask this person about anger, and anger, um, uh, in a generational form of anger, and, and the Lord just stopped me short, and, and, uh, and, and that person's here today. But it's an incredible testimony. But as I, as I shared with that person and I was about to get into the whole, you know, father ladder thing and inner healing. We kind of talk about that, breaking off the stuff. The Lord just said, you want to do this the easy way. And many of you have heard this story, but I just want to share it again. And I said, the easy way, sure. <laughs> yeah. And he said, ask them if they've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And when I, I in my mind, I said, Lord, um, they've been at Dayspring a number of years. And the Lord said again, ask them if they've been filled with the Holy Spirit. So I just sat forward and said, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And this person said, no. And I was like, oh. And so I just, simple prayer for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and, I, uh, and another gentleman and I just sat back and we watched as this person was taken through every range of emotions. Laughing, crying, shouting, jumping, everything. And we sat back just observing what the Holy Spirit could do. And when that gentleman left the room, the Holy Spirit said this to me, Holy Spirit first. Holy Spirit first. And that's how we have to operate as shepherds. More than any, I, I, I think, thing is, is to be alive, to be open, and, and to be uh, listening to the Holy Spirit. And that's what I've often found is it's so important for pastors is that we really behead speculation. We really behead vain imagination. We just cut those things off because as a pastor, I can't come in to a situation and have grace and mercy and empathy ready for the Holy Spirit to work if I have a judgment about you. Because guess what? Pastors know a lot of things about a lot of people. And it's just true because you're personable people and people open up to you. Maybe I should have had that on the first list. You just find people telling you your life story, you know. But, but listen, God is wanting something more. He's wanting us to be able to operate in a way where we come into a situation and we even face off against our enemy and we're carrying no preconceived notions. That happens when we deal with speculation. The term speculation means to look down from a high tower. I love that etymology. And that's what it means. I've got the perspective. Ah, we're all on the ground together. We're all eye to eye. And so we have, to, we have to be able to, I love this, but we have to release people. And I was asked a question last Wednesday. It was a great question. How do I forgive a leader that's hurt me? 
And just the, the thing that came to my mind is one day when I was just forgiving someone, the Lord said, don't stop at forgiving them, bless them. And then to seek God out to know what that blessing means. And so I began to bless. And then I was talking to Nate like a week later, and Nate had this kind of a, uh, you know, a, a epiphany of, you know, we need to partner with Jesus in intercession. We need to partner with that understanding that Jesus looked out and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So not only do we have to forgive and then move into a blessing that comes from the Holy Spirit. God, what do you, how do you want to bless them? How do you see them? But then we come into that place of identification with Christ to say, Jesus, I'm going to intercede for their breakthrough. I'm going to partner with you to see their lives broken. Because if you're a pastor, you also probably and likely come, uh, operate as a, a, an intercessor. This intercession is closely linked with the pastoral gift. And so is identification. To be able to identify with somebody's suffering, that's the first piece of intercession, is to identify and then to come through to the victory. And so you will find yourself praying and interceding for people that you may not even know. You'll find yourself just awakened in the night and you're just interceding. And I'm not saying that that intercessory gift can't function with the other giftings, but we're just talking about pastoring this morning. So intercession is such an important thing. The other thing that's so important in pastoring is words of knowledge, uh, the gift of discernment. Because you get into that situation, again, the Holy Spirit first, right? We get in that situation, and we could take every leaf off, off of that tree. Maybe you'll kill a tree by taking every leaf off. I don't know. But I'd much rather go for the root. And we have enough to do as shepherds that I want to I attack the root. I want to go after the root so this person can come into the wholeness and healing. That's what the Holy Spirit is fighting for us for. And that's what he wants to fight through shepherds for. It's for people's wholeness and healing. You know, again, I've talked about Ezekiel. Um, uh, there's so much I can get into. I'm, I'm going to stay focused here. So um, one thing that the Jesus models, and, and you don't have to turn there, Matthew 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, everything is about service. It's about servant leadership, but... As, as we serve, there is an earned authority that happens. There is, a, a, um, there, is a, there is honor given through our service. And I tell you, we want to model that as a community that we'd be willing to serve each other. We'd be able to give our lives for each other. Philip says, through the pastors, the nail-pierced hands of Jesus are extended to heal, to comfort, to wipe away the tears and to strengthen and protect. In Jeremiah 3.15, he says, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. In Jeremiah 23.4, I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall, shall they be lacking. And of course, you can see that in Psalm 23. If you really want to study the role of what a shepherd is, there's no greater <laughs> chapter in Psalms. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. And that helps us to understand and identify the things that we're called to do. And so rather than giving you all these things, I, I, let's go away. And if you feel that burden and that tug, go explore in Psalm 23. Go look through that chap, chapter in Ezekiel. But I just wanted to end with an activation for pastors. But before I do, I, I, I could talk on this for hours. But I just wanted to hit on a couple things that have meant something in my life. And I want to share those with you. And, and I just want to say this, for the shepherds and the pastors that are in this room, don't ever think your sensitivity is a weakness. In fact, many of you, just like me, have apologized for your sensitivity. Don't. It is God-given for a reason, so that you could walk in a room and see the person that's hurting. Something came out of my mouth. I was sitting with Farley. We were hanging out at a coffee shop a couple of weeks ago, and... Uh, I just love Farley. I just, I, I love just talking and hanging out with him. But in that moment, I think something rolled out of my mouth and it kind of caught me off guard. But I, I said, Farley, I can only be as good a pastor as my family can handle. Let me say that again. I can only be as good a pastor as my family can handle. And that's the truth. I've got to have a healthy home life. I've got to take time for myself to be filled up. 
And sometimes that doesn't mean I could take every call. Sometimes that means that sometimes things don't get returned. I could talk about other weaknesses of pastor, like procrastination for pastors, confrontation. It's, it's something that we really have to overcome to see the value of it in order to confront and love. Because sometimes the pastoral tendency is to procrastinate, and then the situation, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And if you find yourself in that way, that's, that's some of the tendencies and weaknesses of the pastor. We can become, uh, for others, their answer and their God. We can actually, if we're not careful, create codependency in our relationships. But that's why we have the Holy Spirit, and that's why we have the Word of God. I, I love what uh, Phil says, and Dad, if I say this wrong, but the, let's see. The word, uh, the word without the Spirit, and people will dry up. The Spirit without the Word, and people will blow up. But the Word with the Spirit, and people will grow up. Come on. Come on. Well, what I would like today and, and, uh, is if, if you, and we're going to just stay seated for a moment. This is not going to take long. But if you feel with the way that I've defined a shepherd matches you and you just feel that burden, the burden that I carry, would you stand up? And I want to release an, something over you, an activation. And we're going to do an activation together. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And thank God for the other giftings in this room. And I, as a pastor, as a shepherd, I want you to turn around. And I want you just to, just to bless the other giftings that are in this room. And to honor them. We honor you. We thank you. We need you in our lives. We need the apostles. We need the prophets. We need the teachers. We need the evangelists. We need you. Amen? All right, so we're going to do this quick activation, and then we're going to open the altars. Just about three minutes, I'm going to ask parents to go get their kids. So, all right, pastors, shepherds, here we go. So let's just say this together. I will search and, sh and seek for my sheep. That's a tongue twister. I will search and seek for my sheep. Amen. Because you know that everyone's not called to be your sheep. Because there are, there are lots of different flocks. We have to be careful. I will care for my people. I, through God's help, will see people delivered. I will bring them out and gather them in. I will feed them in good green pastures. I will lead them into rest. I will seek for the lost and bring back the scattered. I will bind up the broken and strengthen the weak. I'll take care of bullies with God's help. I will pour out showers of blessings on the people around me. I will help establish a safe dwelling. I will help them move from victims to victors. And I, through God's help, will help them triumph in all things. Amen. So, Father, this morning, I just ask that you awaken every shepherd's heart. Lord, with this new understanding of who we are in family, in the context of family, we need shepherds more than we ever have. And, Father God, I just speak a special blessing over each and every person that's standing today and this morning. And I ask for your special revelation of the, the shepherd's heart that Jesus, you would show yourself in such a special way to each and every one of these shepherds in this house. Oh God, thank you that our mission field isn't defined by one thing or another or what religion has told us it is. But God, this is new and fresh and creative. You've called us as shepherds to shepherd even the mountains of culture. You are opening our eyes to something so much bigger than we could see as shepherds. And so Lord, this morning I ask, for special anointing on the head of everyone. Lord, I release the oil of your love to be able to love the people that you've called us to shepherd. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's 12 o'clock if you're a parent this morning. Oh, you can head over and just have a couple people come up.
If you don't have a relationship with the Lord this morning or you need physical healing in your body, I just want to have a couple people on our prayer team up here. Physical healing and to have a relationship with Jesus, it's so important. Hey, guys, greet each other and love each other. Encourage each other in the Lord. Again, the altars are open. If you're a parent, please head over, get your kids, bless our children's workers. And then secondly, those two pieces, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, we just want to open the altars this morning for you to come down. And if you need a touch in your body, a physical touch, come down here to the altars.